Oh, and by the way, nice to finally meet you. During long expository scenes such as this one, Valve prefers to let the player look Where and walk around to? freely rather than seizing Lamar. player control from the cutscene. Out of there. These scripted uh -oh, sequences right, are densely Clarnet? packed with oh, hello, detail Alex. and optional well, interactions, uh, almost all right. and the player can decide Lamar where to focus his or her attention. Again. This method of storytelling better, helps to build immersion through interactivity and, and, and allows returning goodness. players to entertain Gordon themselves with things they might have missed really the last time you, they played. I found him wandering around outside. This was the first choreographed scene maker, created for Half-Life 2, and was used as a template for similar scenes throughout the rest of the game. Scripts went through many revisions with the aid of feedback from the animators. It was important that the scenes be engaging and interesting for the players watching it, and for the animators creating it. Once the scripts were in the final stages, the lines would be recorded and turned into a radio play. These scenes needed to convince players that the world and characters in it were real and tangible. This was accomplished through visible, physical interactions between different characters, and between the characters and their environment. A handshake or hug between characters, or having someone pick up an in-world object and present it to the player, went a long way toward making Half-Life 2's world appear tangible. We owe a great deal to Dr. Freeman, even if trouble does tend to follow in his wake. Those who had played the first Half-Life were very impressed with the sparse and primitive dramatic scenes within the game. This positive response inspired Valve to push the boundaries of in-game dramatics in Half-Life 2. In order for the game's characters to be compelling, they needed to have realistic and expressive faces. After trying to achieve this via several methods, and being unhappy with the results, they stumbled upon the work of Dr. Paul Ekman, who wanted a clinical way to describe overall facial expressions. He accomplished this by breaking the range of facial expressions down into 40 or so small facial adjustments, like the raising of an eyebrow or the puckering of the lips. By understanding how these adjustments combined together and affected each other to form expressions, a system could be formed that would recreate these small adjustments on a computer-generated face, achieving the realistic and expressive faces that are a hallmark of Half-Life 2. Power armor is common among first-person shooters. Its primary purpose is to provide an in-world explanation for important gameplay elements, like why the player can take so many bullets and the existence of a heads-up display. The HEV suit in particular is useful as it alerts the player of environmental hazards, as well as the current status of Gordon's health. Half-Life 2's HEV Mark V to appears around. to be Get composed mostly of a Kevlar or chainmail-like material, which seems far more realistic than Half-Life 1's rigid and metallic design for the Mark IV. In fact, the Mark V was to be much more flexible, resembling a leather torture suit. However, this was inevitably scrapped, presumably due to a more familiar design that was faithful to the original game. Let's get a move on. The teleport sequence you just witnessed served several purposes. It effectively separates Alex and Gordon, alerts Dr. Breen and the Combine of your return as a viable threat, and sets the player off on their journey with a clear goal in mind, reach Black Mesa East. Several instances of content otherwise cut from the game can also be spotted in this scene, such as the barren sandy wastelands and the ichthyosaur. Hey, Gordon! The Citadel's on full alert. I've never seen it lit up like that. Get out of City 17 as fast as you can, Gordon. Take the old canals, right? They'll get you to Eli's lab. It's, it's a dangerous route, but there's a whole network of refugees, and they'll help you if they can. I'd come with you, but I gotta look after Dr. Kleiner. Oh, and before I forget, I think you dropped this back in Black Mesa. Good luck out there, buddy. You're gonna need it. Here, Gordon Freeman is reunited with his iconic crowbar. Having a commonplace tool as the initial weapon of the Half-Life games helps establish Gordon as an ordinary person being thrust into extraordinary circumstances. It also helps to reinforce the fact that while the series is full of outlandish sci-fi elements, it still has its basis in the real world. 